Mr. Brandis, thanks for speaking with Times Radio today. Pleasure, Lucy. You've been Canberra's most senior diplomat in Britain since 2018. I wanted to ask you, how has the UK-Australia bilateral relationship changed in that time? I think it's become even closer. It's always been a close relationship. But so much has happened in the last four years, um, partly as a consequence of Brexit, partly as a consequence of other supervening and perhaps unanticipated world events that have drawn Australia and the United Kingdom even closer still. The the, the, the two big um, agreements that are, are, are I think, a, a real inflection point in the relationship have been, both of which struck were struck last year, the Free Trade Agreement and the AUKUS um, Security Pact. Uh, AUKUS obviously includes the United States as well, but, but those two agreements draw the United Kingdom and Australia much more closely into one another's orbit. And they do so, you know, for as far as the eye can see down the track. Um, it's significant that the free trade agreement with Australia was the only, not the only, the first post-Brexit free trade agreement uh, the United Kingdom reached, apart from settling the terms of its future relationship with the EU itself. It was the first new one, in other words. Uh, and the AUKUS Pact, which um, was sooner in the making than the FTA, um, was a response to um, the growing concerns that all three of our nations had about the need to jointly work on the development of, of capabilities and weapon systems, especially given the greater degree of contestation uh, in the Pacific uh, and uh, the uh, following the, the integrated review the United Kingdom's uh, tilt to the Indo-Pacific. Well, the AUKUS deal is obviously a standout moment, as you say. Um, the agreement uh, for listeners uh, between the UK and the US to help Australia acquire nuclear-powered submarines. But that's only one pillar of the pact, isn't it? That's right. All the attention was on the submarines, which is understandable. I mean, it's very tangible. It's, uh, it, it was the first big deliverable to be announced. But the, the AUKUS pact has two important components, which in the jargon are described as pillar one and pillar two. Pillar one is the submarine uh, deal. Uh, pillar two is the agreement to work uh, together uh, for the development of, on the development of a lot of other capabilities that we will share, including in hypersonics, in quantum computing, in artificial intelligence, in cyber warfare, and so on. Now, each of those is important. Each is a little, more amorphous than building a submarine, but it, uh, but it's very important to emphasise that Pillar 2 is just as important to the, the grand schema of this as Pillar 1. And, and let's speak frankly, this is about seeing off the threat from China? It's about integrating much more closely than they've ever been before um, the capabilities of three nations, the military capabilities, um, for defensive purposes of three nations. Um, there's no doubt that, uh, that the Pacific, particularly the West Pacific, both the South China Sea and now the Southwest Pacific too, um, are an area of greater um, uh, contestation because of Chinese uh, uh, ambition than they were. And Australia, obviously in large part due to its geographical location, has in many ways been more alive than other Western democracies, perhaps, to the strategic challenges posed by China. I wanted to ask you, do you think that Britain has been too slow to wake up to the threat from Beijing? I think about the delay between the likes of Australia banning Huawei from its 5G, and that's setting a precedent for many other nations to follow. I think the diplomatic response is to say that the United Kingdom has arrived at a good position. I think perhaps the reversal of the initial decision to allow Huawei into your into your systems was uh, something of a tipping point. Um, and I don't think there are many people who would say now that it wasn't it wasn't the right thing to do to to reverse that initial decision, which goes back to the days of, of Prime Minister May, of course. I think there is a greater awareness um, of. Um, of, of, of what China means, um, but there's also a broader context, and, and that context has, of course, been made shockingly clear in, uh, in um, the last two and a half months because of, not of the conduct of China, but because of the conduct of Russia, and more and more, 
I think the Western democracies, or I prefer to use the phrase liberal democracies because you know, the West, the phrase Western is, apart from anything else, a geographical misnomer now, um, um, are alert to the fact that this is an increasingly con contested world between, um, uh, well, to use language of Sir Karl Popper, the great philosopher in a famous book he once wrote, open societies and their enemies. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't use the word enemies, we use the word adversaries. Okay, and you mentioned the fact that it was Theresa May's administration that made that um, reversal on allowing Huawei uh, into Britain's 5G. The, well, the, the initial decision was made during Theresa May's administration. I was trying to remember when the actual formal reversal was announced. I think it was um, just towards the end of her time. I think that's right. And I remember Mike Pompeo came over to London from Washington and uh, I think there were some frank words exchanged. Yes, some spines were stiffened perhaps. But obviously Boris Johnson has in the past referred to himself as a sinophile. Do you feel confident that he is robust on the threat from, Ch from China? Yes. Okay. Yeah, I, but, uh, but your, your Prime Minister gets it. And is there more that Britain needs to be doing as a liberal democracy to stand up to Beijing? Well, I mean, let, I, I, I wouldn't want the narrative to be, you know, a, a binary narrative that you're a friend or an adversary. In fact, we have to be both. We have to deal with China as a, a, a strategic adversary in many ways, uh, as a nation that is not obedient to the international rule of law, as is seen from its activity in the South China Sea, for example. But nevertheless, we want to have a good and constructive relationship with particularly a trading relationship. Now, it's, it's in, 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 in um, all of the coverage in this country, for example, of the diplomatic choppiness between Australia and China at the moment, it's often overlooked that China continues to be Australia's largest trading partner, by far. Um, and what, the, the, uh, in a pragmatic way, Australia and China have been able to do is to maintain in parallel uh, a, a, a strategic relationship which acknowledges that there are deep differences and a trading relationship in which there is much benefit to both. Yes, that, that makes sense. And of course, China is an important trading partner for the UK in many yeah. ways. We, we touched briefly on Huawei and telecoms. Are there other strategically important sectors where you think Britain needs to build its resilience and perhaps be less reliant on China? Well, I don't want to be a commentator. Um, I mean, Huawei is a very specific case, which I instance because of its notoriety. But more broadly, I think the United Kingdom has, uh, in recent years, followed what we did in Australia. In fact, I led this when I was the National Security Minister in Australia during Tony Abbott and Malcolm Turnbull's governments, um, of passing laws protecting critical infrastructure. Um, now, um, I think you're a, a bit a little um, uh, more recent than we were, but the, the protection of critical inf infrastructure from potentially hostile invest investment by uh, where it is not in the national interest that those assets be in foreign hands, in the hands of state-owned enterprises of potentially adversarial states, uh, is something that we've both done. And are you concerned about a sort of a military threat to Australia from China? Well, I don't want to go down that path. I think there's been a lot of loose language um, in the commentary uh, lately. Um, it, it's my job to, as a, as a diplomat, uh, to, to, to keep the peace, as it were. Um, we, we acknowledge that China um, has, uh, over recent years, engaged in a significant scaling up of military capability, including naval capability. That concerns us. Um, but we want to manage this relationship so that it doesn't have a military outcome. And understandably, in the transatlantic alliance, all the focus in recent months um, has frankly been on Moscow and sure. the Russian invasion of Ukraine, and yes. that, that makes sense. Are you concerned at all that that focus um, in foreign policy in the UK, Europe, the US means that the threat from China could be overlooked or given insufficient attention? I don't think that's going to happen. Um, I think what the United Kingdom and Australia increasingly realise is that we have global interests here. Um, 
Australia um, is also supplying a lot of um, military hardware to Ukraine, even though Ukraine is you know, physically on the other side of the world from us, because we acknowledge that a threat to the global order and a threat to peace in any part of the world, but particularly an egregious uh, and flagrantly illegal invasion and slaughter like Putin has uh, executed in Ukraine, um, is a phenomenon, an event in history, which isn't just of regional significance. It's of global significance, and therefore it's significant to Australia too, notwithstanding that we're not imminently threatened by um, that in, in our own locality. Um, equally, I think part of the, of the, the whole um, concept of global Britain is, and, the, and, the, and the tilt of the Indo-Pacific that the strategic review uh, um, announced is like, in, in like fashion that there is an acknowledgement by the United Kingdom that its interests, including its strategic interests, are global. Mm -hmm. And you buy that, do you? Because a lot of yes, critics in, of the Foreign Office and some within the Foreign Office think that actually the, Uve the Ukraine invasion shows that Britain needs to concentrate on its own backyard and doesn't really have much biz business or the strategic reach to really be involved in the Pacific. Well, I mean, I, I think it, it, I don't think one should sort of generalise too much. And Ukraine is nearer to the United Kingdom, obviously, than the Pacific. It's still a long way away, by the way. I mean, it's not as if it's in your, literally in your backyard. Um, the nevertheless, um, we of course, <coughs> the United Kingdom will be focused primarily on Ukraine at the moment, and you know uh, more broadly on the shifting uh, politics of European security uh, that the Ukrainian, uh, <coughs> the invasion of Ukraine has provoked, but. We don't think that's at all inconsistent with the tilt of the Indo-Pacific. And one of the things um, that the Ukraine invasion has slightly knocked off the agenda was last year, there was a lot of talk about creating a new alliance of democracies that would expand the Transatlantic alliance, certainly bringing the likes of Australia, uh, New Zealand, also Japan, South Korea. Uh, do you endorse that plan? Would you like to see that sort of reprised? Well, I, I'm glad the conversation is happening. I mean, it's not the Australian government's policy uh, specifically to declare its support for what is only a concept, but it's significant, for example, that at the G7 um, last year here in the United Kingdom, Australia, uh, along with South Korea, along with India, along with South Africa, were invited as ad hoc members of the G7, um, all of them uh, democracies, um, not with identical interests, but with broadly aligned interests in most cases. So I think the evolution of the global architecture uh, to embrace more of the significant democracies, including um, particularly um, nations um, like in, in, in Australia's region of the world, like Australia and, and, and South Korea, um, is something that is going to continue to evolve, What, whether it takes a more formal shape in a formal redefinition of the international architecture remains to be seen. Would you like to see it take a more formal shape? Well, I, I don't have a private view about that. Um, the, the Australian government, the, the view of the Australian government is to encourage the evolution of uh, democratic structures uh, but what how that what, what shape that will ultimately take um, is something that I think is a way to go. In recent days you suggested to a think tank that UK diplomats should stop feeling guilty about Britain's imperial history and express more pride in the Queen and the Commonwealth. In particular I was pretty struck that you said I wish the self-lacerating classes in Britain would realise that the world respects their own country a lot more than a lot of them do. Do you think this hand wringing is a particularly British trait? I've never thought about that before. No, I don't. I don't think so. Though I think it's in any society, um, you will get a, 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 a voluble um, group who um, are more focused um, on criticism of their own country um, than 
pride than critiques of other countries. I remember, remember in the Mikado, Gilbert and Sullivan had um, the Mikado sing in his list of, 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 of annoyances, uh, the idiot who praises with enthusiastic tone every century, but this and every country but his own. Um, there is always people like that in every country. I think they're quite voluble here in, in the United Kingdom. Um, uh, George Orwell wrote a famous essay called Lion and Unicorn in about 1943, in which he uh, talked about uh, the left intelligentsia which take their cooking from Paris and their opinions from Moscow. Um, and uh, uh, um, Orwell, of course, although a socialist, was a great, great English patriot, and that was why he was derided by the intelligentsia, who were, of course, you know, people who were a lot much inferior in, in intellectual standing than he was. So you always get that, that crowd in any country. There are people like that in Australia. There are people like that in the United Kingdom. Uh, there are people like that in America. Uh, it's um, part of the rich tapestry of democracy. But you and the Australian government reject the sort of post-Brexit declinist narrative about the UK. Well, the, the Australia, um, Australia doesn't get into the Brexit debate. And the Brexit debate has been won or lost, depending on your point of view. What we don't, though, think is that Britain is a nation in decline as a result of Brexit. No, we don't. Um, we see opportunities regardless of whether Brexit was a good idea or a bad one, and I don't want to get into that discussion, but inevitably um, the res a, co a consequence of Brexit was uh, to make Britain alert to the need to have a footprint beyond the Euro-Atlantic. And that is what that was the, 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 the instinct or the, 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 the conception behind the integrated review. Now that has a strategic significance. It also very importantly has, uh, has a commercial or, or trading significance. And the opportunities for the United Kingdom, not only in securing free trade agreements with Australia and New Zealand uh, and now India, but also of joining the CPTPP, uh, the adjectivally um, uh, heavy, comprehensive and progressive trade uh, Trans-Pacific Partnership, are tremendous. Well, let's talk a bit about the bilateral um, trade deal agreed last December between the UK uh, and Australia. Yeah. And uh, I've just you've just shown me, um, Mr. Brandis, a fantastic uh, scribbled note in your office, which I'd love you to tell the, the listeners about. Well, it's a sort of uh, it's a it's a, an artifact of mine, really. Um, when Mr. Morrison, the Australian Prime Minister, and I went to have dinner with uh, Prime Minister Johnson and uh, Lord Frost during uh, Scott Morrison's visit here last June, there were a few outstanding issues that were still difficult. And as always with trade deals involving Australia, because we're such a big agricultural commodity exporter, they were about agricultural commodities, sugar, um, beef and lamb in particular. And we wanted, and this was the position of both the Australian government and the UK government, by the way, we wanted a comprehensive free trade agreement. And that's, in the end, what we got. But we also, as is the most commonplace thing in the world in trade negotiations, acknowledged that there were sectoral sensitivities. Australia had sectoral sensitivities. So did the United Kingdom. The United Kingdom's chief sectoral sensitivities were in agriculture, at least some, though not all, parts of, it, of, the, of the agricultural sector. So the way you deal with that is you have a, a long phasing period. We agreed to a long phasing period for, uh, before tariffs and, and quotas would be abolished for all Australian beef and sheep meat imports, a slightly shorter but still fairly long phasing period for sugar. Um, that was the last thing that had to be nailed down and it had to be nailed down at the political level because um, uh, it wasn't a technical discussion it was just a discussion about you know how much you're prepared to give or take to get this deal i'm not for obvious reasons going to go into what was said it's a, it's sufficient to say that uh, we went into the uh, meeting or it was a dinner a, a meeting without a deal and we came out with a deal and as the 
uh, negotiating uh, between the leaders was reaching its kind of uh, uh, point of, um, of climax. Um, and they were getting close. Um, I wrote a note in my, in my hand writing on the back of uh, um, my own briefing notes, um, which recorded the quantities during the implementation phase that had been agreed to. Fascinating to see. And that's the only con literally contemporaneous record um, of, 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 the, the, of the deal in real time. And I passed it across the table to Prime Minister Johnson. And I said, no, but is this, is this what's agreed? And he looked at it and then but we had an agreement. Now, the benefits of this trade deal have been well set out in, in boosting trade between the two countries, but there are still complaints from UK farmers who are worried about cheaper meat imports from Australia. Well, that's why we've got a long implementation phase. I mean, a, an implementation period of 10 years for both, both beef and sheep imports, and beyond the 10 years, another five-year safeguard period, so that if, contrary to our expectations, there were to be a flooding of the market by Australian uh, beef or sheep meat, then um, uh, protective tariffs would kick in in the further five-year period. So we're not, we don't have free trade on beef and sheep meat for potentially up to 15 years. Now that is such a long implementation period uh, and it was designed specifically to assuage those concerns. And you think that UK farmers should be confident and reassured? They should be and it's been part of my job to give them that level of confidence and reassurance. Over, uh, as Manette Batters will tell you, I've been a frequent attender at the NFU uh, conferences, including earlier this year. Um, earlier this year, I um, made a, a road trip through Wales to meet with a lot of Welsh farmers who've been particularly voluble and concerned about the issue. We had a very delightful and uh, hospitable uh, evening uh, in Anglesey, for example, when I was the guest speaker at the annual uh, dinner of the Anglesey Show Association and all the farmers were there. Um, and my message to them was, First of all, your interests are protected by the implementation, the phasing in through a long and slow period of this deal. Secondly, we don't even think you needed the implementation period because there isn't enough product from Australia to land on your market anyway, because it's all spoken for in markets nearer to Australia, to our near, to our near north. But nevertheless, we've given you the belt and braces protection of the long implementation period plus the subsequent safeguards period. But thirdly, and this is really the main message, look at the opportunities here. I mean, British farmers say, and Manette Batters is such a capable leader of the NFU, always speak um, with great and justifiable pride in the quality of British food. Well, they're right. British food has a global reputation or being produced to the highest standards and of being of exceptionally good quality. If you've got something to sell that is globally recognised as being of the very highest quality, why wouldn't you look to new markets, which the Free, to, free Trade Agreement and the CPTPP opens up for you in parts of the world when you, where you haven't had markets before? Now, climate uh, campaigners were um, alarmed to see uh, any reference to limiting global temperature increases to 1.5 degrees Celsius removed from any final text. There's a lot that the UK and Australia have in common. Is opinion and uh, approach towards uh, combating climate change a key difference between the two countries? No, because we've got exactly the same policy, which is net zero by 2050. Um, and uh, we have we will reach that target, that goal, in different ways, reflecting the different, uh, the availability of, in, in our respective economies of different energy sources. So, for example, in the renewable sector, Australia will always be more reliant on solar than wind because we've got a lot of sun and you've got a lot of wind. Um, in this country, um, nuclear. Um, uh, uh, power as an energy source will continue to be important and in fact the government has announced that it will be of growing importance. In Australia we don't use nuclear power as an energy source because 
decades ago, an Australian government made a decision that the toxicity of nuclear waste was such a, a serious environmental hazard that we shouldn't develop a, 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 a domestic nuclear industry. So we haven't. And, you know, I'm a little, I'm not talking about Britain now, but take a country like France, for example, which relies for a, a very large proportion of, of its energy on nuclear sources. Uh, we're not going to be lectured in Australia about um, emissions abatement on ethical grounds by a country that uses as its energy source an energy source which we, decades ago, for ethical reasons, decided ought not to be used. Well, does the same argument not apply to Britain? Well, but Britain hasn't been lecturing Australia. I mean, you know, some, you know, the Guardian readers have, but, you know, they do that to everyone. Um, there were some concerns, am I not right in thinking, at least among some quarters of the Australian government about um, Britain's uh, High Commissioner um, making a lot of noises, particularly before the COP summit? Um, I don't remember that. I mean, you know, sh the, the, the Britain had a view that we should, that Australia should, like the UK, announce before COP net zero by 2050, and we did. Now, without a doubt, it took us long, a longer time to reach that position than the United Kingdom did. And we understand that there were words of encouragement expressed to Australia to, 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 to get there, and we did. People need to appreciate that because Australia has been so reliant on abundant and cheap coal for so long, this was a longer period and a more difficult period of adjustment for Australia than for almost any other country. And of course, where we landed was a technology-based solution in which we would both at the same time achieve our net zero commitment, but not at the cost of higher electricity prices by bringing other technologies on stream. But it wasn't until we were satisfied that we could do that and we could publish the, 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 the supportable scientific and engineering data that, 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 that showed how we could that we announced our net zero commitment which was in fact announced before the Glasgow Climate Change Summit. And, you remind me and, 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 and I, I should add that as a result of the, um, we, we made that commitment, having published a plan that would show how we would get there by reconciling the three imperatives of emissions abatement or carbon emissions abatement not increasing the cost of electricity by the substitution of other energy sources and protecting, protecting reliability of supply. Ahead of the bilateral trade deal being signed, there were eyebrows raised at the aggressiveness of some of the briefing from the British side. You might remember allies of Liz Truss, who was then the International Trade Secretary, claiming that her Australian counterpart, Dan Tehan, was inexperienced compared to her and complained of glacially slow progress in the negotiations. Were you annoyed by that briefing? No, that, that's, that, look, that, that is, that, I, I don't know if that, if apparently somebody said that, I mean, Liz Trust didn't say it, uh, I'm sure she didn't ordain it. Um, she was a hugely constructive and helpful interlocutor. And in fact, this trade deal was done uh, very fast. Um, we announced the um, commencement of the negotiations uh, in June of 2000, of June of 2000, the agreement, the agreement that was sealed in Downing Street, uh, was announced precisely 365 days later, precisely one year later, and that agreement, in principle, which was a relatively sl slender document, was turned into about 2,000 pages of dense technical text uh, in another five months. Now, having Australia has done a lot of free trade agreements with the United States, with China, with Japan, with South Korea, with Indonesia, etc. Um, I don't think we've ever done a free trade agreement so swiftly. So there, uh, there, there wasn't a glacially slow pace. What there was was a number of points, as always happens in a negotiation, in which at one point in the negotiation, uh, an agreement couldn't be 
achieved, and therefore that had to be um, that had to be uh, the, 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 the technical negotiators' um, role had sort of reached a point beyond which they couldn't go. So those deadlocks had to be resolved at a political level. That's what always happens in trade negotiations. In the past month, Britain's unveiled a flagship new policy on tackling illegal immigration by sending those migrants to Rwanda. It's a policy that's self-consciously modelled on Australia's system. What do you think of the plans unveiled by Priti Patel, the Home Secretary? Well, I'm sure you'll understand that I can't comment on um, domestic politics. Um, Australia was consulted in relation to the way in which we did this uh, and part of the um, uh, Australian system does involve the notion of offshore processing, uh, in Australia's case primarily uh, in the nation of Nauru. Um, the point I would make uh, in relation to Australia and indeed the United Kingdom is that at no, in no point do our arrangements, nor as I read them, the UK arrangements, breach the non-refoulement obligations uh, in the UN Refugee Convention. It is not the obligation of a state to which an application for asylum is made to, se uh, to settle in that state those applicants. Are they successful? It is the obligation of the state not to refool them to um, a nation from which they have a justified fear of persecution under the formula in the Refugee Convention and to facilitate their settlement in a nation in which they will not face those threats, either onshore or offshore. So it sounds like you think some of the criticism leveled at the UK over what's been set out regarding R Rwanda is incorrect and unfair? Well, as I say, I'm not going to comment on domestic, a current domestic political debate, but I am quite, I would be absolutely confident uh, that um, the, the, the lawyers who advise the government uh, have looked very carefully at this and ensured that Britain's announced policy is consistent with its non-refoulement obligations under the Refugee Convention, as is Australia's. And can you kind of confirm the, the level of input that your predecessor, Alexander Downer, has had in helping Britain formulate this policy? Well, it's a publicly... I mean, Mr Downer is a private citizen now, um, but it's a, it's a matter of public record that he was um, retained by the UK government as a consultant um, to uh, talk to them about um, the development of their policy. He, he didn't speak to the Australian government, he spoke as a private citizen, but he is, of course, an eminent former Australian um, foreign minister. Um, now, as a diplomat, I'm sure you're privy to all manner of interesting and extraordinary scenes behind closed doors. And I just wanted to ask, as you reflect on the past four years, are there any particular funny or surreal moments of your time as High Commissioner that will stay with you? There were, there were a lot of surreal moments. I mean, a, a couple of things that I can't tell you about, I hate to be tantalising, <laughs> during the famous dinner at Downing Street when we sealed the free trade agreement were a bit surreal too, because your Prime Minister is a, a, a person who is a, a, a very uh, interesting and amusing and some, sometimes idiosyncratic interlocutor. Uh, but I'm sorry, I can't share those. I wish I could. Um, there was a rather bizarre moment I remember during the last Conservative Party conference when um, in uh, Manchester when um, the Secretary of State, uh, Liz Truss, who I got to know very well uh, during the FDA negotiations, um, uh, when she was International Trade Secretary, was, was gracious enough to be our guest at a reception for Conservative Friends of Australia. Um, which we hosted because it's, you know, my job is, in, I'm in the business of making friends for Australia. So um, we had an event for the Conservative Friends of Australia um, uh, at the Tory conference, I should say. We would have had one for Labour Friends of Australia at a Labour Party conference if, if there was such an organisation. Um, and after the speech, uh, and when it was a very successful and very well attended reception, um, uh, Liz said to me, what are you doing now? And I said, um, I was a bit sort of surprised by the question. And she said, come with me. So I got scooped into her um, official vehicle as motorcade. And she said, we're going to, I am the patron, I think, of the LGBT Tories 
and their reception is the most fun reception at every, every any conservative conference. So you come with me. And uh, uh, so we, 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 we swooped up uh, and arrived at this, um, this um, nightclub somewhere in Manchester. And there was this huge crowd standing around and we got out of her car and went into this this, this this disco, and it was hilarious. I mean, it was a very surprising thing to be asked for a, the High Commission to be asked by the Foreign Secretary to do. But uh, anyway, we had a good time. Um, and uh, it was a f sort of emblematic, I suppose, the reason we closed Bondi developed the Blues Trust during the um, uh, FTA negotiations, a lot of which were in formal session, a lot of which were in fact informally um, in conducted um, uh, at my uh, official residence, Stoke Lodge. Um, the um, people say that the Battle of Waterloo was won on the playing fields of Eton, but uh, in important respects, the FTA was secured on the croquet lawn of Stoke Lodge. <laughs> I want to ask you, when you were in the nightclub with Liz Truss, who was the better dancer? Oh, she was. I can't dance for nuts. <laughs> And uh, may I ask you, Mr. Brandis, what's next for you? Well, I'm going back to Australia to reconnect with my long neglected children. Uh, and uh, uh, I do have something uh, in mind that I will be doing back in this country um, after a long holiday uh, in Australia and uh, of which more later. Great. Well, the weather hasn't put you off clearly. So we look forward to seeing what your, uh, what your next moves are. Uh, George Brandis, outgoing Australian High Commissioner to the UK, thank you. Thank you.